Good morning. This is the House Healthcare Committee on Tuesday, May 4th. It's nine o'clock. Uh, this morning, we are returning to the important issue of children waiting for mental health inpatient services in emergency departments across the state. And we had invited uh, Commissioner Squirrel and the Department of Mental Health uh, to come back and provide our committee with follow up to the testimony that we heard last week, um, or was the week prior, I think, uh, in, in terms of the, the large number of children waiting and what many of us considered a, a crisis situation that needed some immediate response. So I appreciate hearing, having the Commissioner of Mental Health and colleagues with us this morning. I'm gonna turn it just because we have, we have between now and just a few minutes before 10, uh, there's a document that's been provided so committee members should access that. And I'm going to turn this over to Commissioner Squirrel to uh, provide us with the information and presentation this morning. So good morning and welcome Commissioner Squirrel and others. Right. Thank you, Chair Lippert. Um, good morning, committee. Great to see you all. Uh, for the record, Sarah Squirrel, the Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health. Uh, very grateful to be joined here today by several of my colleagues from the Agency of Human Services, uh, Commissioner Sean Brown, Commissioner Corey Gustafson, uh, Selena Hickman from Dale, as well as Laurel Omland and David Rattu from the Department of Mental Health. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. We do have a presentation prepared for you, so just bear with me for one moment. Did that work? Yes. Wonderful. It's on full screen. Excellent. Okay, um, so I was not able to join the committee for previous testimony on this issue. Uh, we did hear from the committee, we did share data related to the issue of youth presenting and waiting in emergency departments. And there were a couple of goals and takeaways that we took from that meeting um, and really what we've been working on um, over the past week, um, as well as um, ongoing efforts on behalf of the Agency of Human Services and the Department of Mental Health. Um, number one is continuing to identify and address barriers for accessing care for children and youth for inpatient. Um, and number two, uh, which I think is what the committee is expecting from us today, um, is to really present what are those concrete and actionable strategies that we can utilize to A, improve access to care for children and youth, to reduce, reduce emergency department visits and wait times. And essentially what you see us doing here at the Agency of Human Services is to identify the scope of the challenge and then to work together to try to solve it. I believe that this was noted um, in our last testimony, but I do think it's important that when we think about um, the issue of children and youth waiting in emergency departments, it really is a systemic issue. Um, and it's a systemic issue that requires system solutions and responses, which is why I'm so grateful for my colleagues at the Agency of Human Services for joining me here today and who have always joined me um, in terms of how we address this and how we address urgent issues in our system of care. When we see long wait times in emergency departments, whether it's children and youth, whether it's adults, which is another um, area of the system of care that we have all grappled with, it really is symptomatic of having inadequate flow in the system, which is really our ability um, to manage individuals and in accessing levels of care appropriately and in a timely way. Uh, certainly we know that with the recent surge in youth waiting, uh, one of the challenges and one of the factors contributing to that was that many of the youth who were receiving inpatient treatment at the Brattleboro Retreat, which is our only inpatient capacity for children and youth, about half of them were actually ready for discharge. They were ready to discharge to a lower level of care in our residential system. And we simply had an adequate capacity in the residential system. So our inability to essentially transition those youth to a lower level of care is appropriate really created this backlog because then you have individuals and youth waiting in EDs because we're unable to move those children and youth out of those beds. So again, it's just important to keep that in mind particularly as we're looking at solutions. The other thing that I would note is that all of our human, human services systems have been impacted by COVID. 
our capacity, um, our workforce. Uh, so I guess I would say that our systems of care certainly um, not without the incredible efforts of our community mental health and other community providers um, have certainly not been operating in full capacity um, over the past several months. And of course, it's essential that we have to be responsive to put forward solutions that are integrated um, and that really focus on the continuum of care in our systems. Other factors that contribute um, to this issue, you know, why are we seeing this surge? Um, why did we see uh, this tipping point? Certainly increased mental health needs due to COVID, um, particularly for youth ages 12 to 17. We know that even prior to COVID, we have been seeing significant increases in anxiety and depression. Uh, we also know that as a result of COVID, depression and anxiety um, continue to increase. There was a PACE study that was done by the University of Vermont and the Vermont Department of Health um, in the fall and a follow-up study done in the winter, um, really demonstrating and indicating that we are continuing to see increases in depression and anxiety for the youth. Also just noting that schools not being fully reopened over the past year also is a factor that impacts um, uh, child and youth mental health. Uh, and the reason for that is that I shared some data, I think at our, uh, perhaps in one of our previous committee meetings, that in calendar year 2020, almost 50% of children and youth on Medicaid receive their mental health services in a school setting. We have an incredibly robust school-based mental health system across the state of Vermont. So when our schools are not fully opened, um, then our children and youth don't have access to many of those critical services and supports that are available to them, which is why every effort has been made and should continue to be made to fully reopen our public schools. Also, as I noted, we have reduced capacity in the system of care. Many of our community mental health partners and other services and supports are not being offered fully in person um, because of COVID restrictions. Um, we are working and those are part of our solutions um, to try to improve that. We looked at a slide, I think I will be sharing it in a minute, just in terms of capacity in our crisis beds and our residential beds, um, as well as what we are all aware of, which is a broader issue for our entire healthcare system, which are workforce challenges. And then we also see a lot of seasonal fluctuation and demand um, when it comes to um, children and youth um, needing inpatient level of care. Um, this is actually one of the issues that contributed to some of the um, financial instability for the Brattleboro Retreat. Um, there is significant fluctuations in demand for child and youth inpatient care. Um, we have data that we have shown in the past, um, particularly in the summertime, we tend to see a pretty precipitous drop in terms of demand, um, which is why our efforts um, to move the Brattleboro Retreat to an alternative payment model, um, that was one of the main goals. Um, so it's just important to note that when we're talking particularly about this level of need in the system of care, we do see a lot of seasonal fluctuation. And I think what that means for us as a system is that we need to have capacity in the system that can be flexible um, to be responsive to that demand when it does fluctuate. And I think implementing the alternative payment model at the Brattleboro Retreat was a good step in the right direction. And then I, Sarah, if I could jump in here, the other thing I would add on this on the seasonal impact is we do see flow in our residential system slow a little bit this time of year as kids that are ready to transition from a residential care setting to a lower level of community care. Um, uh, the programs tend to hold off because it's cl close to the end of the school year and to not disrupt, you know, the end of, the, of that school year education for that child or youth that they then kind of hold off until the school year ends. And so we do see the flow in the residential slow this time of year, just because of the timing with the end of the school year, not wanting to impact the education for the students. And so that, that's a factor as well. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Uh, this slide was shared at the last testimony, again, just illustrating uh, some of the bed closures that we have across the system and some of the reduced capacity that we have had, um, particularly in our hospital uh, diversion beds, uh, primarily due again um, to COVID precautions um, and restrictions as well. 
And one thing I would just note about hospital diversion programs, which I'm sure the committee is aware of, um, and our great partners at NFI for their great work, um, the hospital diversion program um, really truly serves as diversion. Uh, so for children and youth um, who might um, be presenting in an emergency department, our care managers here at the Department of Mental Health, um, working in close collaboration with emergency services uh, staff across the state, are always working um, to have children and youth admitted into the, or youth, I should say, admitted into the hospital diversion program so that they don't need to go to the EDs. Um, so even though it's just a couple of beds that have been offline, um, given that the numbers that we're looking at in Vermont, they actually make a pretty significant impact. I also wanted to provide some updated data. Uh, we have certainly seen uh, a recent surge um, in youth presenting in EDs, as well as uh, wait times. And again, I think what this chart uh, really demonstrates is some of that season seasonal fluctuation. Um, so this chart kind of picks off, picks up where our last chart left off. Uh, this really is intended to provide a snapshot of what we've seen uh, from the end of April through today. Um, so again, just really illuminating um, that over the past few weeks, uh, we have fortunately seen a decrease um, in the amount of children and youth who are presenting in EDs. Um, again, this is not to minimize the issue. Uh, we never want children and youth waiting in emergency departments. It is completely inappropriate, um, but this does illustrate some of that fluctuating demand that I was referring to. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. go ahead, represent I, you and then myself. Yeah, I know you can't see hands when we've got go the ahead. screen share. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, um, I, I know last time we saw information, it was pointed out that this um, is only involuntary or Medicaid voluntary, but that the number of uh, non-Medicaid voluntary was fairly small, so it wouldn't be uh, significantly different, just maybe by a few. But 422, you're, you're identifying nine and the hospital association identified 19. So that seems like a pretty huge discrepancy. I know in the past when we tracked adult, um, it, the numbers were significantly higher for um, the hospital, what the hospital was seeing and what DMH was reporting, but that was at, without including, uh, that was involuntary only, not Medicaid voluntary. So I, the, um, the difference between the VAS numbers and, and your numbers is much more significant than I would have expected. Yeah, I think it's a great question, Representative Donahue, and we can certainly go back and overlay our data with VAS. One of the things that we have been trying to do, um, the way that we receive this data is for the emergency services staff um, to call in the number of children and youth who are waiting um, to our admissions on a daily basis. Um, over the past couple of weeks in particular, we have been calling around to ensure, does this truly capture everyone who is waiting in your EDs? Um, so I am sure there could potentially be um, some children and youth um, that maybe are not captured here. But I think even when we look at and overlay the trends between VAS and DMH, I think you'll still see the trend line moving in the same direction. I, I think you're right about the trend line. I just think it's worth looking into further because it's, it's really about half, uh, half the numbers that VAS is reporting from the same mechanism of contacting each of their EDs on a um, you know, point in time weekly. I realize that's not an average, but it, it seems it should be closer than um, 50%. Yeah, and what I can say in terms of the data that we looked at yesterday, uh, we called every emergency department across the state to ensure that this number was accurate. So that was my, my question, is that, is, is this, I'm a little unclear as to when the number of youth waiting uh, for emergency exams and Medicaid voluntary, are there youth that fall outside of those categories that might be waiting that would not be captured in this data? Or is it the case that uh, at least as of today or yesterday, this indicates that there are only three children, not only, but there are three children waiting compared to the numbers that we had seen earlier. 
numbers we've been provided. Does this, is that what this indicates is that there are three children in the emergency? Department? That's correct as of yesterday. Um, and I would say what falls outside of this and what Representative Donahue is noting, which is such a good point, um, is that for youth who are voluntary but have private pay insurance, um, that is not information that is always available to the Department of Mental Health. Um, certainly, as I noted, um, given the attention on this, we want to make sure that our data and reporting is accurate, which is why um, over the past couple of weeks, we have been doing even more follow-up with the EDs and our community mental health providers to ensure that these numbers do represent all youth that are waiting. So that leaves me still with the question, is this three youth who are waiting across the state on May 3rd? That's correct. Pl plus four private pay? Or is that three youth who are Medicaid and additional or private pay? Yeah, the information that we have, Representative Lippert, that as of yesterday, there were three youth waiting. Across the entire state? Across the entire state. Again, this is not to minimize that this still no, is I, an I, urgent I and important that. issue. No, no, and I don't I don't hear you doing that, but it's just really important to try to understand if we're having if we're capturing the capturing maybe not the right term, if we're, if we're uh, identifying the number of youth who are in need of inpatient mental health care, but who are waiting in emergency departments. Correct. Thank you. Yes. Um, this next graph, again, this is just uh, a snapshot of what we have seen, um, essentially, I guess, in the first four months of 2021. So again, it really illustrates, you know, kind of the trend line creeping up, creeping up, going in the wrong direction. The significant spike that we saw um, in, I guess, early April um, and continued through April, and then kind of the downward trend that we have currently seen um, over the past couple of weeks. So again, just additional data um, for folks to have for awareness. We certainly, Vaz is a great collaborative partner with the department. So we'll continue to work side by side with them to ensure that we can provide data um, that accurately reflects um, all of the needs in the system of care on a given day. So we were really tasked with thinking about, you know, what are the short-term immediate actions and strategies that we can take um, as well as more midterm and long-term actions and strategies but I will pause for a moment and it looks like there might be a couple of questions. Okay, uh, Representative Peterson and then Representative Donahue. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, Commissioner, could you go back a slide? And yeah, I, when I look at the slide, the only question I have, did, did anything happen systemically around January 17th? Um, it seems like there's a significant jump after that date. Did, did you know, we lose some, some mental health professionals? Did we change something? Did beds go out of service? Then I'm, I'm wondering if anything of significance happened to, from that point forward. Yeah, I, I don't know if at that moment um, there was a, a significant systemic change. What I can say, Representative Peterson, and it's a great question, I think this is the result of many complex and interlocking factors, as I noted, um, the ongoing impacts of COVID, schools not being reopened, um, yeah. our um, provision of services um, uh, being somewhat more remote as well. Um, and, you know, it's fair to say that we have been grappling with ongoing workforce issues. Um, and that is a need, not to mention, I think what we are seeing um, is increased trends around particularly for youth. Um, the impact of COVID has significantly impacted their mental health. We are seeing far more depression and anxiety. And so I really think that's what is bearing out here. In addition to some of the typical seasonal fluctuation and demand that we even usually see this time of year, which I think was reflected in the data that was shared last week. And do you do you routinely track this data? I mean, it wasn't tracked because it's a problem now. With, what is it or or? 
Yes, this is data <laughs> that we continuously track. We have okay. longitudinal data for a significant amount of time related to this, which I think was shared at the last committee meeting, but we're happy to follow up and share that again. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Donahue and Representative Page. Uh, yes, if you have this on the next slide, skip the question, but I had skimmed them before and I didn't see it. The, the length of wait, because you know a, a child waiting 24 hours is obviously serious and traumatic in an emergency room setting, but a child waiting three or four days or sometimes more than a week is you know, more on the horrific end. And this doesn't indicate how long um, any, num any of these children are, the number of hours or average length of stay. Yeah, another great question, Representative Donahue. We focused on the number of youth waiting to be able to pull some current data for the committee today. Um, we can follow up and have our research and statistics team um, also look at the uh, length of waiting time data as well and to get that to you this week. I think we may get it this afternoon. I think uh, you know Voss is doing a weekly tracking as well. So. Um, they, they are tracking both of those in their weekly reports, which I assume or hope they're, they're sharing with you as well. Yes, I have not seen the recent data from Boz, but um, again, that is something that we hope to work in close collaboration with them on. There's a page. Yes, my question had to do also with the waiting times. The three youth that you reported that are sitting in our, our EDs currently, how long have they been sitting there? Yeah, I would have to follow up with you, Representative Page, about the specifics for those three youth. And, and what should be the minimum amount of time that our, our youth are sitting in emergency rooms? Yeah, another great question, and I think something that we're taking very seriously. I think really um, this data is meant to illustrate um, the significant fluctuation that we see in terms of demand um, for inpatient and children and youth waiting in EDs. So let's continue with uh, those uh, solutions. Great. Uh, so just to, to dive right in uh, to some of the solutions that we've been looking at, um, just the first one that I would note is really related to our system of care recovery. You know, our state is moving towards recovery. Um, guidance is shifting as conditions on the ground improve. And certainly we want to ensure that that guidance is also applied to um, our community mental health agencies, um, as well as our residential providers, because as uh, Commissioner Brown noted um, one of the issues that we need to address is adequate step down capacity for those youth who are already inpatient so that we can move them out of those inpatient beds and free them up for youth who are waiting. Um, so fortunately we were able to provide updated guidance to all of our community mental health agencies um, just uh, late last week. Um, this was done in uh, collaboration with the Vermont Department of Health, uh, which really um, shifted and allowed all of our community mental health agencies and staff um, to follow under the category of Group A, which is low to no touch healthcare workers, um, which allows um, more provision of inpatient or in person services. Um, that guidance is really critical to our community mental health agencies and leaders um, in terms of moving towards more full in person support, particularly in the community um, and in our de emergency departments as well. The other guidance that we were able to update um, just this week is guidance for some of our residential providers. Uh, they, of course, have been operating under um, restricted uh, distancings. Um, that has impacted residential capacity across the state. Um, so working with VDH yesterday, we were able to put out new guidelines for youth in congregate care um, that does uh, bring that um, for child and youth at three feet of distance. Um, into play, which again, um, just gives those residential providers more flexibility, um, thus increasing their capacity, thus allowing us to move children and youth um, into the appropriate level of care um, at the right time. So I would just note that those two pieces of guidance and change um, are new just in the last week. Um, also the NFI uh, diversion program, 
also moved to that three feet of distancing. That was actually one of the main factors that was causing them to have those two beds at each of those locations closed. Um, so reopening those two beds at both of our hospital diversion programs uh, will have a significant impact. And I just wanna express my gratitude um, to the NFI hospital diversion program um, for their leadership there. Um, they've just been incredible in terms of being responsive to this change and working very hard to reopen um, those additional beds as quickly as possible. We also, of course, given that one of the challenges that we were facing um, is the amount of youth who were at the Brattleboro retreat who were unable to discharge. Um, so again, grateful to our partners at the Depart Vermont Department of Children and Families who worked closely with us um, to really triage around discharge options to try to you know, move those youth out so that we could free up that capacity. Um, and again, grateful for the work that was done there. Um, it always takes time, um, but they really did um, step up and allow us to alleviate and open up more of that capacity at the Brattleboro Retreat. The other piece I would note, um, and this is something we've been working on over the past year, um, there is another child and youth inpatient unit just across the lake, uh, CBPH. Um, it is a part of the UVMC network. Um, it is run by Dr. Altoff. Uh, we've been working with CBPH for over the past year to try to figure out how can we create a path by which more Vermont youth can access inpatient care at, B at CBPH. Um, CBPH was you know, getting its feet under it, um, working on improving its staffing. Um, and fortunately, over the past several months, again, with great collaboration with CBPH and Dr. Altoff, um, they've been able to admit at any given time, four to five um, Vermont youth um, to those child and youth units. It is a little bit more complicated and there are more caveats anytime that you are taking children and youth across the lake, as you can imagine, um, and into a different state. Um, but for voluntary youth, um, this has been another great asset to the system and something that we are continuing to work with CBPH around. Um, the other area that we are looking at, um, as we've testified before, we have a significant amount of federal funding that is coming into the Department of Mental Health. We really wanna work with our community mental health agencies to identify and target those funds um, to specifically address this area. Um, we convened all of our emergency services directors, child youth and family directors, DA execs uh, last week to have a conversation about this. Um, shared and collaborative planning with them has been underway, but we have a lot of flexibility with these federal funds that we can target to address some of these systemic issues um, and to create more capacity. And of course, we are constantly working. Um, we have two care management teams here at the Department of Mental Health, adult and children's, whose sole job is to triage and work with our emergency departments, emergency department directors, and emergency services teams um, to ensure that we are triaging around any children and youth who are waiting um, to get them access to care as quickly as possible. This is just a review of the federal funding and additional federal funding that the Department of Mental Health has been in receipt of and will be in receipt of. Um, we are certainly looking very closely at the supplemental um, block grant funds, the additional 1.4 million and 2.8 million listed at the bottom here, um, really afford themselves to a lot of flexibility um, and provide us with an opportunity to really target those investments, you know, with the guidance of our community mental health agencies. You know, we really want to hear from them in terms of where they think the most investments need to be made um, that will help us continue to address this issue as a system. So can I just, if can we go back to the page on immediate solutions? Because I think that's really the area that we were, I think, most immediately interested in as well. And I'm wondering, um, it's important for us to also understand uh, midterm solutions as well, but uh, can you give us any sense of uh, what you estimate to be the impact of these uh, plans for immediate solutions? What is there? Is there a goal and is there a measure that you will be using to determine whether this has an impact and in what time frame? 
Yeah, it's another great question. And I think that, you know, what we would anticipate to see is that as our systems recalibrate and reopening, including our public education system, we will see increased access to services and supports um, as a result of some of the changes um, to guidance, um, allowing the provision of more in-person services, as well as flexibility in our residential providers, it will open up capacity there. We've already seen the immediate impact of our hospital diversion programs being able to open up more beds, as well uh, as our can, residential. Can I just interrupt? Part, part, pardon me for interrupting, but so has the have the uh, NFI. Uh, beds reopened based on the guidance or will that be something happening in the near term? I believe that's something happening in the next week to week and a half, but I will just, Laurel, do you have more insight into that? Laurel just texted me this yes. week. <laughs> it's my understanding that NFI will be opening one bed this week and then the second bed that has been closed will be opened the week of the 17th of May. And there are four beds total, though, that are that have been closed. Is that right? So the, the two closed beds in the NFI North program are closed because of the COVID um, precautions that they've been needing to follow. That's where the right. guidance is helping. The two beds in the Southern program are due to staffing challenges. Right, so and so they don't have a targeted date for those. OK, so the co so th that's what I was just trying to get a, a, a sense of. So the COVID, the change in the COVID precautions will result in the very near term uh, this week or next week, uh, the addition of two beds in the NFI North program, but the South program is a staffing issue and that won't be impacted in the same way. Thank you, Thank Laurel. You. So I think all of these immediate solutions will contribute um, to ensuring that um, there is more timely access to care, that we see um, a reduction in A, youth waiting and wait times. However, to your good question, Representative Lepert, I think it's incumbent upon us and probably work the Department of Mental Health, maybe in collaboration with DIVA and VAS, really do need to set some benchmarks in terms of, you know, right. what do we really want to see as our goal as a system of care in terms of number of youth waiting and the amount of time that we are waiting. And then we need to strategically continue to try to address that. Um, so I do think that's something that is important that DMH does in collaboration with DIVA and VAS um, and that we set that benchmark for ourselves, um, maybe based on national standards, maybe not. Um, Vermont is typically a leader you know, when it comes to setting the bar high in terms of expectations of care, particularly for children and youth. Um, so I do think that's another immediate next step um, that we should also be working on. So we have a number of questions here. So let's let's pause and take those questions uh, before moving on to midterm solutions. Uh, Representative Donahue, then Representative Houghton, and Representative Burroughs. Um, yeah. So two quick things. I I thought that there was already an existing uh, benchmark that had been um, stated out there, and maybe that was only for adults, but that was a four four hour um, wait time. Um, but um, but uh, the, the question I had prior was looking at the immediate solutions. Um, we know that there are ups and downs continuously. So even if there are improvements in this, what I would almost call a semi midterm, um, we, we can anticipate that there will be times when there are spikes, spikes even with improvements, they're, they might be smaller, but for those children, they're not smaller impacts. What I don't see there is anything about uh, crisis management for children who, for whatever reason, do end up uh, waiting, uh, whether large or small numbers. Um, what we're doing about the, the immediate environment for those children in the emergency room in terms of supports, mm -hmm. space, um, things that could happen within days rather than weeks. Uh, for children who are currently there. And I was hoping to see some of those things in terms of a crisis response. Has there been any look at that? Yeah, exactly. we did. We did. We did pass on a statutory basis several years ago, a specific requirement for DMH to provide um, ongoing support for people who are waiting through, uh, through work with the, the DAs providing personnel. And I'm wondering if any of that is happening. That was already a directive um, several years ago. 
Yeah, thank you, Representative Donahue. A great point and question, um, and certainly that is illustrated in our uh, midterm solutions um, in terms of the actual environment of care, if you will, in terms of the emergency departments themselves. Um, and of course, this is where I think the guidance um, is helpful in terms of the provision of emergency services and supports being more fully in person in emergency departments um, to ensure that that care and support for children and youth that are waiting is there. Um, and it is true uh, that um, some of those supports have been offered um, more through telehealth over the past several months um, due to the impact of COVID. Um, so that's something we really need to work with our community mental health agencies and our emergency services um, directors and staff um, to understand what capacity do they have, um, how best do we continue to focus on that, um, also in collaboration with our partners at the Department of Children and Families. Um, I know that for any child or youth um, who is in DCF custody, who might also be presenting in an ED, um, that there are DCF staff um, that are supporting them in the emergency department as well. Um, but again, we wanna make sure that we're doing everything possible um, should someone um, be waiting, uh, whether it's the environment of care or the supports around the child and the family. Coloring books and puzzles could be provided tomorrow. You know, I mean, there are some crisis things that can happen in, you know, 24 hours or five days, not weeks and months. Just Yes. And this is why the dialogue with the legislature as partners is so critical and helpful, because we can also take back your good suggestions in the short term um, and apply them immediately. I can add, this is uh, David Ritchie from DMH. We, we are meeting every week with representatives from emergency departments. And one of the things we are implementing is what, what can we do for youth that's not just waiting, that's actually therapeutic to them while they're, while they're waiting. And, and that can take the form, everything from supportive psychotherapy sessions to um, crisis plans, um, to maybe even meditation sessions, people are doing those and trying to implement evidence-based practices. So in addition, people are also trying to figure out a way to make the physical space more therapeutic. And I know some emergency departments are trying to actually create space that is not so hectic and is more conducive for people in a mental health crisis. Um, well, we can discuss this in another setting, I guess, because that's um, um, that that has uh, not been successful, despite those hospitals who would say they have done that. And last week, there was a child who was in a locked, uh, quiet subsection with two male adults for um, an extended amount of time. So uh, it may have been a separate, quieter subsection, but I don't think it was therapeutic. Representative Houghton. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, throughout the presentation you've given so far and in other presentations we've had, um, the Department of, I should say the Agency of Education and the need for kids to be back in school keeps coming up as a preventative measure. Um, I will say I am um, I'm happy with all the agencies that are here today, but I am concerned that the Agency of Education is not represented nor is there any immediate solution on the agency of education and DMH, and, and maybe there is, and it's just not here, um, working immediately as these children go back to school for the last six weeks to be able to assess the situation of the kids in need that are not in the EDs, but could end up in the EDs to ensure that we don't continue this um, this process. And, you know, we have six weeks for kids until they are back for the summer and we lose those connections with the schools. So I would like to hear at some point, not now, more of how the Agency of Education and DMH are working together in the schools themselves. And then to Representative Donahue's point, um, you know, I just have to say, I keep going back to that puck program that's happening in the southern part of the state where these kids are not in the ED, they are in a home. Um, you know, how, how hard would that be to get set something up in other areas of the state um, would be an immediate solution I would like to see. Thank you. Again, all good points and captured on the next slide. Uh, okay. but I just okay. haven't been able to get there yet. <laughs> okay, well, I think we were focused on 
what we were. I would say I would think some of those could be immediate, especially with the kids back in school for six weeks. Of course. And what I can say um, is that the Department of Education or the Agency of Education and the Department of Mental Health have been working side by side on this. I meet with Secretary French on a regular basis. And this is not just a new issue. You know, we've been working incredibly hard over the past year just to include the provision of school-based mental health services, even if not being offered in a school, are still afforded to and provided to children, youth, and families, even if it is remote. Um, one of the three pillars of the, I guess, the three-legged school of the Agency of Education's recovery plan is social emotional competence, mental health and well-being. Um, part of the task for local education and supervisory unions is to actually form recovery teams that bring together their community mental health partners to really address this. So I think what I can say is that that collaboration is happening, that we are working very hard to ensure that as children come back to school, that we have the right services and supports in place. And I think that's where at a real advantage, you know, we have one of the most robust and revered school-based mental health services programs in the country. Um, so as our children and youth come back to school, that partnership and collaboration between our community mental health agencies and our local districts um, will become even more important. In addition to the Agency of Education being very clear and somewhat directive to the extent possible that the local districts need to be targeting some of their ESSER funds to support social and emotional development and support for children and youth as they come back to school. So let's take a couple more questions uh, and let's, let's understand that we will want to, we want to allow the commissioner to move on to the next set of slides which are touching on issues which are being raised. Uh, Representative Cordes, and then we'll go on to the slides. So um, in recognition that you still have more to show us, Commissioner, um, I'm just going to put my question in um, right now um, and feel free to wait until you get to that uh, a slide if it's represented there. We know that um, I, I'm thankful to see the information about how we're responding to this um, both the, the recovering from the pandemic, but also the um, latest crisis and the surge of youth um, in emergency rooms. Um, I would I look forward to seeing more about how we can strengthen our system um, outside of a, of a surge, outside of a pandemic. Um, the pandemic has shown um, a light, as we know, on so many gaps um, and deficiencies. And we also know that um, ther therapeutic um, care for children um, with mental health needs, um, we had a need for that before the pandemic. Um, and uh, I know that um, families were not happy having to um, send their kids all the way down to Brattleboro if they lived up north or across the lake. Um, and I know we are building capacity, but I would like to hear more about that so that we can um, use all of the aspects of our mental health care system in Vermont and truly create some systemic, um, have some su systemic success so that we have um, therapeutic milieus in place um, instead of um, just responding to crises. So let's let's let the commissioner respond to that in the course of her continued presentation. Thank you, Representative Cordes. Those are excellent points. Um, so moving on to midterm solutions, which many could be articulated as more immediate solutions. Again, I don't want to get hung up on semantics. Certainly it is the goal of the Department and the Agency of Human Services to be very responsive um, to this current need. Um, and also this has been an ongoing need and issue in our system of care. Um, number one, as we noted before, in our immediate solutions would be to work with our community mental health agencies to identify where we can target this federal funding. Um, we want to then distribute that funding appropriately um, to address those mental health service needs, as well as opportunities to expand and support workforce development as well. Um, we also want to ensure that we also prioritize funding for peer support services for children and families, just like in our adult system. Um, we have great uh, nonprofit partners who work um, 
and providing peer-based supports um, to families. So that is another area that we want to look at. And to everyone's good point, um, we have two opportunity areas as well. Um, mobile response has already put forward as a direct solution in response to this issue. Our ability to respond more proactively in the community to a child, youth, or family in their home as an evidence-based practice that other states have seen significant returns on investment is a huge opportunity for us, which is why we are so excited to be piloting uh, mobile response with our partners in Rutland, who I would also note are also working on an alternative to EDs um, as part of um, their work with mobile response. So they're supplementary. Um, so not only are they working to advance mobile response, they're also working to create alternative spaces similar to the PUC program um, to divert children and youth from emergency departments. The other thing that I would note from a policy perspective, which is significant, is that we are looking at the opportunity to leverage increased FMAP for mobile response services over the next three years. Um, the federal government has indicated and provided guidance that effective April of 2022, we will potentially have an 85% match on mobile response services. Um, this is huge for us as a state as we look to advance those specific programs, as well as continuing to look at um, expanding and scaling up alternatives to emergency departments such as the PUC program at the same time. Um, as Representative Donahue noted, one of our other um, pieces here was working with VAS collaboratively su to support the emergency departments. You know, what are those short term, I guess, easy lift, as Representative Donahue noted, pieces that we can do in the immediate that just require some people power and thinking and follow through. Um, in addition to some of the bigger issues, I think about environment of care best practices um, and how best do we support our EDs and advancing that and committing to that with us. Um, to Representative Houghton's good points, continuing to collaborate with the Agency of Education. Um, as I noticed, as I noted, their recovery planning is hinged on social emotional competence and well being. Um, it is clearly articulated in their recovery plan and directives to their local education agencies. Um, they are also um, working with us to expand access to youth mental health first aid training, training through Vermont Care Partners. Um, again, in addition to just the incredible collaboration that we've had over a decade in implementing school-based mental health services with our education partners. And given the influx of ESSER funds coming into the education system, that is a huge opportunity um, to really focus and target those investments um, to the social emotional well being of children and youth. Um, I would also note this probably is more midterm to longer term. Um, that the Department of Mental Health is really committed um, to really articulating probably very similarly to what we did with the 10-year plan. What is our five-year workforce strategy? Um, it is certainly lifted up as an element of Vision 2030. I think we need to really get down to brass tacks of what do we need to advance and stabilize our mental health workforce in a comprehensive way. Um, a member of my staff will be convening leaders this week um, to start having that conversation. We would welcome input, collaboration um, with our legislative partners, but I do think that this workforce issue um, is a big part of the solutions to ensuring that we have a strong continuum of care for children and youth. Um, I'm going to turn now uh, to some of our other partners at the Agency of Human Services. Um, again, grateful for their joining us today, who will, as I mentioned, this is a systemic issue that requires a systemic response on behalf of all of the Agency of Human Services. Um, so Commissioner Gustafson, um, as well as Commissioner Brown and Selena Hickman um, will be sharing um, some of the work that they've been doing um, to contribute to solutions to this. So I will turn it over to Commissioner Gustafson. And I'm, I'm going to, par pardon me, I, Representative Burroughs had her hand up oh. earlier and I failed to acknowledge her. Uh, so I, I do want to get that her question on the table so that if it gets answered uh, as we go along. Representative Burroughs. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I had to take a quick call from my my son's school. Speaking of children's mental health, <laughs> um, I have a couple of very quick questions. Uh, one is, um, how many people are in the Rutland catchment area for their mobile response? 
Oh, I will have to follow up with you, Representative Burroughs. I don't have that off the top of my head. Well, is it is it like five thousand or is it a hundred thousand? I mean, is it? Let, let's get back to that. Okay. Okay. Um, on on a slide, a few slides back, uh, it had the amount of money that was being given to different areas, and uh, I noticed that uh, SAMHSA was getting. Um, uh, I think four separate grants. Uh, and I wondered how those monies um, would be, how much of that would be spent on um, our youth since it was all included in the, the amount being spent. And finally, um, I noticed in the, the midterm and long-term solutions that, that uh, there doesn't seem to be an inclusion of um, uh, integrated whole family supports. And I wondered whether uh, uh, this was being taken into account as part of the problem or solution. Thank you. Thank you. Great questions. Um, we provided some more detail um, on those buckets of funding that are coming into the department. Some are more prescri prescriptive than others. For example, the SAMHSA COVID emergency grant was really focused on funding for emergency services. So we have to deploy those funds to support that. Um, the supplements to our mental health block grant are much more flexible and it will be up to the department um, as well as our community partners to determine where we target those resources. And that is the work that needs to be done. Okay. And to your last question, um, Laurel um, can maybe follow up with you. There is a lot of work happening um, in terms of integration, particularly with pediatric practices and our broader healthcare system. Um, so it's not noted here, but it probably should be. Um, maybe as more longer term ongoing um, uh, problem solving and support, uh, we have uh, utilizing some of our block grant funding um, to support psychiatric consultation and pediatricians offices. Um, some of those efforts that again, we need to continue to focus on as well as part of this continuum of care and treatment for children and youth. So let's, let's we, we really only have a short period of time left, but let's uh, hear, let's hear briefly from the through the rest of the presentation. I know the commissioner has a commitment and needs to leave at 10. Uh, good morning, Corey Gustafson, Commissioner of the Department of Vermont Health Access. I really have two quick points to make. Um, I'll actually make the second one first, um, evaluate payment rates for hospital diversion. That is the NFI uh, hospital diversion program, uh, evaluating the methodology for which those rates, at which, under which those rates are set setting up a uh, recurring review of those uh, rates for scheduled updates um, and uh, utilize the existing contract that we have with them as, uh, as the sort of parameters under which um, those rates would live. So we're in that process right now. This the first opportunities for alternatives to waiting in emergency departments. I think under the VAWS, um, letterhead, you saw a few recommendations, including moving from episodic to per diem. Um, we're certainly open to a payment methodology that uh, fits um, the incentives and outcomes that we're all looking for. I think Rep Lippert's point to what's the metric, what are we trying to accomplish is a great point, and that will help us determine what is the best way to approach that reimbursement structure. The, the, you know, the balance of that conversation is always episodic, was in, is intended to sort of incentivize movement through the system. But if there isn't movement in the system, that, is a, that incentive is really, um, you know, not very useful. So um, the per diem uh, is perhaps uh, something to explore with some sort of parameters in terms of care um, delivered. Um, if someone is in a in a crisis state and um, is in, a, in, a, in an environment for an extended period of time, um, we would always love to see that there are services provided along with those uh, changes in payment. Um, and so that's a conversation. We have um, explored opportunities or are exploring opportunities to pay for temporary play, placements on the pediatric unit at UVMMC as a, as a movement from the ED um, and the, Partners at UVM have been really good about thinking in that in that space, um, and 
um, hoping that that would lessen the acuity and, and allow for the transfer of um, the less restricted placements. Um, so um, those two points in the time is where I'll, I'll stop. Rep Lippert, thank you. Thanks, thank Corey. You. Um, and then Selena Hickman from Dale um, is joined us today as well. Selena. Thank you for the record. Selena Hickman, Director of Developmental Disability Services at Dale, and I'll be brief. Um, Sean, Commissioner Brown has his own slide as well with more information. Um, so we're really looking at three areas aimed at reducing um, emergency department and hospital use, looking at local crisis capacity, statewide crisis capacity, as well as um, an RFP creating something we're calling intensive transition supports. So at the local level, uh, we've heard from DS directors statewide that there is a need to expand local crisis capacity. We've connected with a few individual agencies regarding their current planning, and we're also preparing a survey to ensure that we understand what is uh, available statewide. It's not, it's something that we currently look at at an individual uh, level of approving local crisis supports, but not um, systemically. So that's the first step there. Um, looking at our statewide crisis capacity, we currently have two statewide crisis beds operated by the Vermont Crisis Intervention Network under the Upper Valley Services umbrella. These are available for people who exceed local, uh, local crisis capacity. Uh, they offer consultation, training, mobile supports, as well as on-site supports for short-term stays of one to three weeks. Uh, for many years, this level of two statewide beds has been sufficient. However, since before I came to the department, um, we had been hearing that additional capacity was needed. And so we are currently looking at our ability to expand, hopefully by July 1st, although that's still in the works. Um, and then finally, exciting news that we have an RFP that's currently open uh, that creates something called intensive transition supports uh, for individuals experiencing extended crisis, including children and youth with complex needs. This is a level of support um, for between one and six months. Um, so this is, these are time limited uh, supports for people who are eligible for a developmental disability, home and community supports who are experiencing crisis and whose current needs exceed other available clinical and crisis supports in the DC services system. Um, so these are a lot of the folks who are kind of bouncing in and out of emergency departments. Um, who have intensive behavior challenges, um, likely have co-occurring diagnoses, who just need additional time and consultation um, and expertise in order to develop a successful community-based support plan. So we're quite excited about this RFP and our um, intended start date for a vendor is August of 2021. And I'll stop and, and hand it right over to Commissioner Brown. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to need to come back to these because I think there's certainly questions, but that's that's not take them now. I'm um, sure, um, you know, at DCF, um, you know, we have a large number of kids in our, in our care and custody who need, um, you know, varying levels of care and services. Um, much of our care right now is skewed to the higher level of care. And we have a lot of kids in higher level of care and youth um, out of state. And one of my goals as a new commissioner was um, to reduce that reliance on out-of-state programs and bring kids back to Vermont and have them served in Vermont and at the local level as much as possible. So it helps keep those kids connected to their community and, and, trans and make transition back to their community much easier. So one of the things that we've been working on is uh, we're looking to create um, uh, a, a group of high level, um, high end stabilization foster homes across the state. Um, you know, at least one in every district in, in several in some of the larger districts. Um, you know, we would provide specialized training to these foster uh, parents and also um, connect them to uh, community um, services to make sure that they can meet the needs of these higher level kids so we can keep them in their communities. Um, these foster homes would receive a, a higher level of, 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 of uh, uh, support and, and, and financial support as well. Um, we're currently recruiting for these foster um, families, and so far we've had 18 uh, reach out to us and express, uh, express interest to work with us. And so this is something um, we're hoping to roll out in the coming months. Um, this has clearly been a need um, out there, um, and this should help um, relieve some pressure in the system as well, because these kids would then end up <clears throat> in higher levels of care 
um, which then forces us to move kids to uh, um, out of state care. So we kind of want to shift the dynamic and bring services back to a more local level as much as possible. Also, you know, we've had an ongoing level of need in, in the northwestern part of the state. And so um, we've been working um, with, the, with the designated agency up in that area to create um, a stabilization program for youth, again, to try to keep youth in their community. Um, this would be a two-week program where um, we would stabilize the youth um, and then transition them back into a community setting um, with, with wraparound services. Um, for, a, for a period of time to help stabilize them. Um, we're currently working with NCSS to come to an agreement on, on, the, on this program and develop it. Um, our goal is to roll it out as quickly as we can. Um, and then also um, we're working with an organization called Families First um, to create a um, in-state capacity to serve youth who uh, are struggling with mental health issues, but also a developmental disability. Um, I think um, one of the areas we've seen in uh, um, Commissioner Squirrel can touch on this a little if needed, but some of the youth staying a little bit longer in, in emergency departments fall into this category. And so there's certainly um, a, a need for this type of program in Vermont. And many of these youth end up eventually in programs out of state and it takes time for them to, to, to get connected with those programs. And it also takes a lot of time for them to come back and transition to back. So it's important for us to develop this, this in-state capacity here um, and so uh, they provided a proposal to us and we're working with them, um, you know, again, to hopefully roll this out as soon as possible. Um, this would be located in the southern part of the state right now as well. And so these are just some of the programs we're working on to kind of help build more capacity at the community level to serve youth. Because right now our systems are more geared to the higher end and it just creates a lot of capacity issues. And we want to keep kids connected to their communities as much as possible. So I'm going to, uh, we're, we're all operating under competing schedules here, and uh, I'm going to suggest that we bring this to a close because we are actually also doing the floor, the floor, uh, the Zoom floor. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Brown, uh, Commissioner Squirrel. I, I, we're, we're going to clearly return to this, uh, and there's lots here to digest. There were a lot of questions, uh, uh, and I know that you, have Commissioner Squirrel, have a commitment you need to leave to get to the governor's press conference as well. So um, I'm, if there's any final comment you wish to make, Commissioner Squirrel, and then I think we need to wrap for the morning. Yeah, I want to thank the committee for their time this morning, um, for their great and thoughtful questions and ideas. Thank my fellow um, commissioners at the Agency of Human Services. We, we do see this as a AHS issue that we're all need to be responsive to. The only two final things I would note is that we did have a residential analysis report and recommendations um, that we would love to spend a little more time with the committee on, uh, which I think will also something we need to take into consideration and just, um, I'd be remiss without mentioning mental health parity, um, just again, as one of the solutions we need to look at ensuring that private insurers cover the same levels of medically necessary mental health services for children and youth, especially in home services. And I will leave it at that. Again, thank you. There's, there's much here for us to dive into more fully. Uh, we do have some testimony this afternoon as well, and uh, we will be following up because I think what's one of the things that's key here is to put some metrics and some measurements and timelines uh, among, among the number of initiatives that you've laid out in front of us today. So we will look forward to doing that collaboratively, uh, hearing from you about that. So with that, we're going to, we're going to bring this to a close. Thank you, Commissioner Squirrel uh, and staff who've joined her. Thank you.